May 5th, 2006, was a turning point in the life of Patrick Kennedy. On that day, the New York Times ran two stories. The first, Patrick Kennedy crashes car into a Capitol Hill barrier. Then, hours later, Patrick Kennedy says he'll seek help for addiction. It would be the first time the congressman and son of Senator Ted Kennedy publicly admitted his problems with addiction. He was born into the closest thing this country has to a royal family. Patrick Kennedy, youngest son of Senator Ted Kennedy and former congressman from Rhode Island, was finding his place in the family dynasty. But years of addiction and mental illness would stand in the way. Everything coming to a head when Kennedy crashes his car into a traffic barrier on Capitol Hill. Witnesses said he appeared intoxicated. The accident was the turning point that led Kennedy to sobriety. Now in his new book, A Common Struggle, Kennedy faces his addiction and mental health problems head on. He also reveals his family's pattern of alcohol abuse. He describes his dad's negative reaction to an intervention attempt and recounts his embarrassment having to hide his inebriated mother from visitors, breaking what he refers to as the Kennedy Code of Silence. Please welcome former Congressman Patrick Kennedy. His new book is A Common Struggle, A Personal Journey to the Past and Future of Mental Illness and Addiction. And the book is filled with lots of shocking admissions, and I do appreciate the integrity and honesty it takes to talk about these things, especially coming from your family. You. So let's start at age 10. It's the first time you say you got drunk. It's almost impossible for me to envision that happening at such a young age. Um, well, you know, when you live in a busy life and a lot of people are drinking around you, it's not hard to, to also drink. And I can't say that it really grabbed me um, until much later in my life. Let's jump forward then, because you talk about your life at age 18, where you're drinking too much, using cocaine, you know, you're manic depressive. Did you know at the time that you were in trouble? I had no idea because with most of these diseases of addiction, they accompany a denial. It's shocking to me when I look back that, you know, I could do these things and not have anybody say, hey, guess what? You come from a family where addiction is prevalent, um, where trauma is prevalent, and you need to look out for this. But no physician, no pediatrician ever bothered asking, you know, what can I do for your mental health? Of course, they. They checked my asthma, they did all the other physical exams, but they left out what I think is the most important physical exam, a checkup from the neck up, when physicians now will require that, that they do the neck up because we leave out anxiety, depression, addiction from all of our sins. You bring your family, as you have to, I think, into this discussion quite a bit, and some of them aren't happy. Uh, I've got a, a statement from your brother, Yep. Ted Kennedy Jr. has been public about this. I'm just going to read it. Sure. He said, mental illness and addiction are critically important issues that deserve a serious discussion, not a narrative that is misleading and hurtful. What do you say to your brother? Well, I love my brother. He's my sibling. I will always love him. And I think that these issues are really difficult to talk about. The thing I write about in The Common Struggle is that the common aspect of this is that we don't want to talk about it. Because we look at it in a shameful way, when in fact, people are suffering. My mom never would have chosen to live the life of disability that she suffered from. And frankly, she suffered in a generation where everybody suffered, that this was some kind of moral failing as opposed to a medical issue. And today, we've advanced a great deal, Dr. Oz, but we're still not kind of out of this shame and stigma that still pervades any discussion of these illnesses as real physical illnesses. So if your father was alive today, all I'm gonna ask you, do you think your father, Senator Ted Kennedy, was addicted to alcohol? I think my dad clearly self-medicated after the assassination of his brothers, which really have to be called murders. I, I can't imagine the incomprehensible pain that my father went through and it's not surprising to me that he would self-medicate with alcohol. Would it have been healthier for him to have been able to be public about that? 
Well, you know, Dr. Oz, if, if he were experiencing those losses today, the whole medical community would take him aside and say, you need to get help. I just hope that we can have a conversation about how to look at these issues in a non-judgmental way. When we come back, Patrick Kennedy's going to reveal what his father, Ted Kennedy, said to him when he went public about his addiction. Stay here. We're back with Patrick Kennedy talking about his new book, A Common Struggle. So that day back in 2006, when you admitted you needed help, that you were addicted. Yeah. What did your father say to you behind closed doors? Well, he said, do you really want to talk about this? Um, I was in the position at the time of being the lead sponsor of a legislation that would require that illnesses of addiction and mental illness be covered by insurance companies in the same way they would cover any other physical illness. I mean, the brain shouldn't be left out of insurance coverage. Uh, revolutionary concept, you know. <laughs> uh, but it's unbelievable that we tolerate the level of the epidemic of suicide and addiction and overdose in this country, and we're just absolutely silent about it. So your father, I'm sure, heard you give these arguments. You talked about this a lot. Well, you know, my dad really bought the political argument. And my dad uh, came on the floor of the house when we were debating the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act and tapped me on the leg and said, this is important, keep it up, keep it up. And he always was ahead of the game. You know, he was promoting equal rights, human rights his whole life. And I think he understood that this was a medical civil rights issue. He understood that people were disregarded and dismissed. And I think he always was thinking about people who are living in the margins of society. This bill that you've referred to has changed the face of mental health care in this country. And you made the argument that we should treat mental health issues and addiction like they're a cancer. Not because you're a cancer, but because cancer is a chronic illness too, that you often don't get completely better from, but you can get a lot of help for. How does that help deal with the shame and stigma around mental health? This is an epidemic staring us in the face, and it's the elephant in the room, Dr. Oz, because just like we don't like to talk about it in our own families because we're feeling shamed, we don't talk about it as a society. Our government is ignoring this issue, and we don't hear it from anybody. And I think that this ought to change. I think it will change. I hope the book helps start the conversation. Well, I'm always surprised when you hear tragic stories like Lamar Odom, and, you know, folks that you think have everything and they get in the bad situations with drugs. We're always sort of surprised, but it's happening every single day, numerous, numerous times. And I'm, 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 I'm still concerned we haven't put it on the radar screen in the right way. And in your case, just to be personal about you, it's been five years now that you've been sober. Four and a half. Four and a half. You count the days. <laughs> How do you get there? How do you go from a person who's so ashamed you're not talking about it. There's someone who's been sober four and a half years. So we have to treat body, mind, spirit. We have to treat the whole person. <laughs> and so we need to give the body, the brain, enough time to be detoxed and kind of be in a good space. Then we've got to make sure that the mind, the mental compulsion to use, is treated with Evidence-based therapies, cognitive behavioral therapy, very strong evidence of recovery with it. Then you have to address the spiritual aspect, which means you've got to be part of a community where you're embraced and you're loved. Because that's not a familiar experience for anyone who's suffered from addiction or alcoholism or mental illness. They're really ostracized. And so they need to be amongst their peers to be loved and embraced. And then something magical happens, Dr. Oz. People have a new life that is beyond their wildest dreams. No one... So let's talk about your journey. So in 2011, you, you meet Amy Sowell, who is a school teacher. She was in the audience with us. You have three kids, one more on the way. I, I gather the community you're speaking about is, is Amy and her team. So what is it like, Amy, to love and live with someone who's struggling with addiction and mental health issues? You know, it's been really important for us uh, in our relationship that I'm supportive in my own lifestyle for the things that Patrick needs, living a healthy lifestyle, but also that I give a lot of significance to his exercise, 12-step meetings, and that he has time to do those things and not feel like um, 
that selfish time that that's really part of his whole health so that he has that time. So much of this conversation revolves around how families talk about these things. Mm -hmm. What are you going to tell those beautiful children of yours when they're the right age about their father's problems with addiction and, and your fears for them? Yeah, we have a, uh, we're expecting our fourth child and we already are talking about it in our house that Patrick goes to 12 step meetings. They know that they see him go each morning. They also will hear that they have a genetic predisposition and we're going to talk about that and, and let them know this is something that you need to think about, be aware of. Good for you. Yeah. So Patrick, last words to you. You speak so I'm brilliantly. Blessed. You're Aren't blessed. I blessed. You are blessed. Such an incredible wife. Yeah, we are blessed. I mean, we you have know, you. you can't make it if you don't have family that's supportive. It really matters because these are family illnesses. You can't have the illness and not have it affect your whole family. And in recovery, you need your family to be part of it. I'm obviously, you can't always win with every member of your family, but I'm blessed that my partner in life is absolutely behind me. Thank you for your insight. Patrick Kennedy. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss out on new videos to live the good life.